Welcome to Evolve to Succeed, the podcast that brings together business owners, leaders and experts to talk about their business journeys and provide them with invaluable insights and explore the link between personal and business success. I am your host, Warren Munson, founder of Evolve. I've previously founded, grown and successfully exited three businesses in the business services and technology sectors. I have a passion for helping and advising businesses and seeing them succeed. We all know that leading and running a business comes with its own unique joys and challenges and Evolve provides the advice, guidance and support to the business, you and your teams on that journey, be that if you're starting, growing or looking to exit or step away from your business. We do this through our Ignite, Thrive and Optimize programs and services, which includes strategic advice, coaching and mentoring, leadership training, funded business support and so much more. If you want to learn more about Evolve, then please do go to evolveadvisory.co.uk or connect and message me on LinkedIn. For now though, let's just get on with the show. Welcome. This week I'm talking to Martin Higgins, Managing Director at MSP Capital, a company he developed with his father Ray in the late 1990s. What was then a small operation has since grown into one of the leading providers of commercial finance in southern England. Specialising as primary development and bridging lender, MSP Capital extends property development lending solutions for amounts of up to £10 million. Possessing extensive financial expertise, Martin is well versed in debt restructuring. With a professional background of over two decades exclusively focused on offering business and property development funding, he commands a comprehensive understanding of the market, financial metrics, debt structures and risk. Amongst other things on this episode, Martin talks about he pivoted the business following the 2008 financial crisis, the complexities of transforming a family business to a director, shareholder, owner-managed business, as well as the challenges that growth presents to the benefits of private equity investment, managing risk in a business that's notoriously risky, and his investment into Wimbledon Town Football Club. It's a really wide-ranging conversation, which I hope you will enjoy. Welcome, Martin, to the Evolve to Succeed podcast. Thank you, Warren. It's great to have you on the podcast. There's so much I want to discuss with you today. I want to discuss a bit about the business, the industry you're in, but really also the backstory and the growth story, which is phenomenal around MSP. So for our listeners, we perhaps should just put this into context. Give us, Martin, some detail of the nature of the business and a few facts and figures about MSP Capital as it stands today. Yeah, so MSP Capital Limited, we're a specialist property asset-based lender. So in simple language, you lend against UK property, um, secured. We're best known as a residential development project funder. Um, That's what we've done pretty well from the the start of the business. Head office is based in Poole in Dorset. Uh, We lend uh, nationally, England and Wales, but... You know, the hot spot really of, of the loan book is in the south where we can, you know, see everything, touch everything, get get to it relatively easy. Loan book's currently around about 450 million um, and we've got 46 staff now at uh, at the head office. Brilliant. Yeah. I'm fantastic. And I, this all starts, as I understand it, as, with a business that was founded by your father, Ray, in 1981, if I got that right? Spot on. Yep. Long um, time ago. And... Perhaps give me a little bit of a backstory to that. How did the business come about? Do you think you were always destined to be part of this business? Uh, start start with where it came from. I think um, Dad set the property, the, the company up originally as a property investment company. Um, he sold his business um, in around 88. And at that time, you know, wasn't really doing anything. He stumbled into lending. Um, bizarre story but he was at dinner somewhere somebody was talking they couldn't get a lend off the bank on a table by him and he got talking to them and uh, ended up our first loan was lent against a cherished number plate um, back in 88 Um, so that's really where it started he then talked to a few other people that sort of got introduced by this borrower Um, and, and then it started to grow a little bit and I joined and started taking an interest around 1999. Um, the business was growing. 
dad was sort of running it on the kitchen table at home. Right. So it had no real staff at that point as no. such. It was yeah. one man band, lots of um, paper spreadsheets, yeah. no computer systems, no nothing. Um, so, yeah, I started working during the daytime um, with dad and sort of just trying to understand it, learn that, learn a little bit about the business and help him. And then in the evenings and weekends, I was working in catering because I had a hotel restaurant. Um, and and finance started to feel like a career path for me the more I learnt about the business and certainly became very apparent back then that the returns in finance were certainly outstripping what I was earning in catering. <laughs> well, two, you could have had two completely different industries. It must have been a bizarre double life nearly you were leading, wasn't it? It was a little bit odd, but it sort of changed, it, it, it intermingled. So I used to have um, the Sea Witch Hotel in Camphor Cliffs, which is yeah. now, you know, Lock Fine or the Anchorage as it's called. Um, so I was running that. Dad was living opposite, lending money. A buyer came along that wanted to buy the Sea Witch by chance. Um, and he hadn't quite got enough money, and so Dad ended up lending the money to buy the. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it plays it, a part in life. Oh, ab- it? absolutely, and um, and yeah, and then it sort of just went on for there, and I could just, I could see opportunity in what he was doing, but I really wasn't property or lending savvy yeah. enough to be able to sort of contribute at that time. So I just sort of went along for the ride for a few years, just learned, see learned what I could do. trade with him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what point did the business start to gain traction then? Because, I mean, it's a completely different animal now, and we'll talk about that transition. But what point did you think, actually, this business has got some really strong foundations? Your dad had kind of got the business model right, but it needed some, I suppose, I'm going to say professionalism, but some operations, some systems, yep. and some ability for it to scale. Mm. I, think, I think we sort of did 2007-8 was where... The world changed in yeah. terms of in terms of the banks. Um, the property market went down. We were exposed on a few um, a few assets behind NatWest because we used to lend second charge, and we had a very good relationship with NatWest. So we'd put a slice in behind them on projects. We I learned an incredible amount two thousand seven eight because you, you know you learn the best thing about protection of risk and and rewards when actually the market's really against yeah. you. So we work very hard with all of our developers, um, all local, um, and we managed to finish all of their projects at the time when the banks were trying to not give them any more money. So we said yeah. to the bank, freeze, we'll put the money in finished, and actually on every single one of our loans, the banks got fully repaid, we wow. got fully repaid, and the developers got a few quid, which in comparison to what was happening in the market, yeah. that was extraordinary. The market was decimated, so, wasn't it? it? It was, and that's really where I sort of felt, okay, this is this is really interesting. I yeah. learnt a lot, and I just thought, and you also have this vision of a cyclical property market, and I was thinking, so okay, with the market's changed, everybody's running scared of lending on property, but actually, this is the time. You yeah. know, this is when the property prices have fallen. Why are the banks wanting to run when the market's adjusted? So I was pushing Dad quite hard to sort of say, look, this is the time we need to step in. So we, we transitioned from sort of mezzanine lending, second charge, to being first charge lenders. Oh, okay. um, and that's really when it started to get exciting because your risk profile is so much better if you're a first charge lender. Yeah. But because there was the banks had vacated the space, we had the ability to continue to charge the rates yeah. that we charged. Brilliant. And things have obviously continued since. So, so at what point did you fully take responsibility for the business you know and your dad sort of exited the business not until the day he signed over the last share (laughs) um so 2011 um david joined the business as the first non um david capra is the first non higgins family member to become a shareholder quite a big moment for dad in terms of you know relinquishing a bit of control and then david and i decided that the opportunity was there and we we structured a management buyout to basically take out the rest of my family um, yeah. and brought in Paul uh, Maraca, who's now and is still is a current shareholder. And so we did a management buyout. I kept my shares. David and Paul came in and bought the rest of the shares from the family. So from that point, we had control of the business. Yeah. Um, and, and it changed instantly. You know, dad was very protective over the old name of the business and wouldn't didn't want yeah. to change the name. And so, you know, day two was name change and, and okay. starting to get focused and, and, you know, try and grow the business in a 
a much more corporate way yeah. with a view to taking more risk. And, yeah. you know, to be fair to Dad, he was 70. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was beyond wanting Time to take risks. in life, and, I'd imagine, know, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, it was... It, the, the whole ethos of the business changed at that point, and yeah. that was um, that was quite an exciting time for us. But also, you know, it was difficult. You know, negotiating with your family is yeah never, never easy. easy. Yeah, but there's not many businesses that success. I mean, congratulations! Because I don't think there's many businesses that successfully transcend from being a family business to a sort of director, shareholder, own, mm. owner, managed business. Yeah, I think dad, dad's. Um, Dad's business idea and philosophy was amazing, yeah. um, but he, he was getting on and his ability to translate that into a growing business was difficult. And I suppose what well, I had the benefit, 2006, seven, eight difficult times, and then nine and 10, to really draw as much information out of him as I could. And you know the principle and the ethos of what the business still does is set up around everything that Dad represented yeah. back then. Um, so I, you know, I think I had great... Um, assistance getting to that point by being able to work with him and you know to be fair afterwards he was he's, he's still there you know I can pop around for a coffee and yeah. dad I've got this come up what you know yeah. what do I do and is he proud of what you've achieved with MSP I, I think he is I think you know he's um you know he's, he's still an investor so you know we, we do private investment into the business and yeah. he's still an investor sort of 12 years later so I guess that answers itself um but yes I think you know I, I'm sure he's proud and you know it's it was always his baby, so I, I try and steer clear of that conversation. And, you know. <laughs> it might only have to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, brilliant. And obviously, we've talked about where the business is today, and we'll talk about you taking on some PE capital and, and, that, and the consequences of that. But I'm really intrigued then. So at that point, there's three of you, directors, shareholders. It must feel great. You've got a team around you. You go on this you know, amazing growth journey from that point, building the business, bringing people in. Um, one of the things I know when, you, when I looked at the business and what I know of the business, you've got a lot of people that have been with you a long time. Mm. So, but what are some of those challenges around growth and, you know, and that journey you've been on from taking the business from that kind of small, successful business to where it is today? I think, I think in terms of challenges, there's two distinctions that I would bring. There's a challenge in, in the scaling of the loan book and in, in our business, our stock is money. Mm. So, you know, we had to, we had to go to the city and find sources of money. Um, and, you know, the simple principle of, of borrowing long and cheap and lending short and more expensive. Mm. And that really, you know, that first, I think 2016, we got our first facility from one of the challenger banks. Okay. Um, and that was a huge moment in time because when I look at other businesses and you know there's a lot of businesses that operate in our space, the hardest piece that they seem to have at the moment is going from sort of 15, 20 million to 50. Yeah. And you've got to get that you've got to get that corporate um, structured finance into the business. And yeah. that was where we, we worked very hard and got our first facility. So that you know that was one side of it and and also trying to keep the um the underwriting policy and and the relationship led service because i yeah. felt that was the biggest thing we added you know when you used to phone up your bank manager and your bank manager could give you a decision um these days that doesn't happen no. and we try and do that so one of the things we did was took three four of the bank managers from NatWest and brought them into the team okay um because you know they've been around they've done property for a long time and I think the other thing is is just getting the culture right in the business, getting everybody to buy into the journey. Um, yeah. I think in certainly the 23 years, I would sort of say I've been involved, I think we've had five people leave the business. Um, so, you know, our turnover rate is very low. Um, we try and reward our staff and, and take them on a journey and, yeah. you know, really buy into what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to do and, and you know, and also have fun. You know, business is, business is tough at times yeah. and you've got to be able to have a bit of fun and, and enjoy yourself and, and that's certainly something that, we're, you know, MSP, we try hard to do. And so if I, and in some ways you've kept the best of that kind of family entrepreneurial kind of spirit because those businesses are usually great fun yeah. to be in and you've scaled it and kept that fun is that the essence of I think it is your engagement I think, model that you've got that aids that retention I think the, the the balance is exactly right between you've got to have a corporate 
when you get to our size, it's got to be corporate. Yeah, you've got but, systems and processes. But you? entrepreneurialism is something that you just never want to kill amongst yeah. amongst the directors, amongst the staff. And, you know, when you get structured finance from the city, you know, there's so many checks and balances you've got to do. And so you've got to try and work a way around access to that money, but doing it in an entrepreneurial way so that you are that little bit different to the market. You yeah. know, we are fundamentally an office full of property people yeah. who lend and whereas if you look at most of the banks and a lot of our competition they are office based ticking boxes yeah and i think that's that's really the biggest thing that we've tried to keep um everything's around one head office so we've never sort of been tempted to go let's have an office in birmingham right. never done the geographical spread no, from no. spreading the offices no you just I think you lose a bit of control. Yeah. Um, you know, we can. Property is relatively simple. It's a legal charge over an asset at land registry. Yeah. You know, it's it's relatively simple business, and you lend money and you hope you get it back. And, yeah. and actually, you can do that in Manchester, Birmingham, from Paul. It's not yeah. it's not something you need to go and look at. So um, that that really is 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 where we've tried to keep things super super tight, super exciting. And, and just try and mix that corporate side with, with enjoyment and fun. Yeah, definitely. And with all those people you've retained, have you got lots of stories within the business of people growing with the business? Or, so have you got, I suppose what I'm asking is, have you got to grow your own mentality with the team? Or are you bringing, because of the speed of growth, have you had to bring senior people in to take senior positions? I, yeah, I think one of the things that I've always had to recognise is, you know, I'm sort of running a finance business and I'm not an accountant yeah. and I'm not a surveyor but we're in property and I'm not a banker. So the way I've tried to always do it when we're employing people is is bring people on board that are better than I am in that particular field. And if you get, if you can keep doing that, your ability to scale and grow is massive. It teaches, every day I go to work, I learn something new. You know, the guys have been doing it, you know, as long as I have, but in a banking format. And then also all the other aspects of the business now, compliance, marketing um, you know there is underwriting side the legal side just employ the right qualified people that know far more than me and then try and put all those parts together to yeah. to make the whole yeah um, and that's that's really what we've tried to do and is that how you see your role these days Martin is it the person that is it the conductor of the orchestra I think to some extent I, you know I try to do that but I'm I'm a real attention to detail and you know I'm I like to be first in the office and last to leave and okay. that, that I still do that now um you know I like being across all aspects of it um you know one of the things I've re- done recently was uh, sort of we we jumped from 30 staff to sort of 46 within a very short space of time and I sort of sat at my desk and thought we're all open plan but we're spread over quite a big you know six suites of offices now and I just thought I don't know some of these people so yeah. I'd, I'd spent the whole of November last month just spending three or four days in all the different departments and getting to know people at all levels of the business and and actually I, it was probably the best month I've spent um, okay. you know really getting to know people understanding what all the different departments do because it's very easy just to sit in your chair and it all just yeah. you know, it all just happens so that was a really exciting part and I, and I think you know from the feedback I've got but maybe they tell me what I want to hear that they all enjoyed it as well so yeah brilliant yeah. <laughs> are they going to say anything else exactly <laughs> um, but you did take this money in from Cabot Square Capital so now I'm really intrigued because a lot of people we have on here have done part of the journey they've maybe they've been a family business they've transcended generations or they've been a uh, you know owner managed entrepreneurial business and they've become employee owned some have sold to PE but you've now completed a kind of third stage which I think is extremely rare which is family to entrepreneurial to PE backed yeah what and a lot of people when they're sort of owner managed entrepreneurial run scared there's so much scaremongering out there about Mm -hmm. don't take PE money it'll change the way you operate it, you know it won't be fun it'll be run by numbers all of that kind of thing but clearly you've succeeded by taking that money in what do you say are the clear benefits of having PE on board I think I agree totally with what you're saying I heard so many as we were approaching um, you know completion I heard so many stories about PE some great some really really not so great and I think 
one of the things that you know was stuck in my mind is is what control do we keep in you know selling a majority of the business mm. and and David Paul and I kept a, a smaller share, but I have to say you know from my experience I mean Cabot Square Capital have been incredible. Um, Richard and James there uh, went onto the board immediately, and it, they they just. How do I describe it best? They're like a, a big brother that you can go to for advice. You know, they specialise totally in the finance sector. They've never once, you know, tried to override anything we're doing. They let us do what we do. Um, everybody says that's because, you know, if you if you do what it says on the projections and you keep hitting your projections, PE, keep quiet. But, you know, the market has been interesting mm. with, with um, COVID um and and with the the interest rate rise but they've just you know they believe in us they let us get do what we do and because of that we keep delivering and and having that trust of a a big brother yeah. just gives you that confidence and albeit they did the transaction with us and acquired the shares from David Paul and I even today and and 5 years in they've never put a penny into the business all the all the growth within the business has come from organic growth and reinvesting of profit. So there's been no additional investment into the business from them. They've just been a relatively passive shareholder along yeah. the journey. Yeah, it's interesting. It's great to hear you know, a good news story around PE and all of those things. Uh, talking about competition, I suppose, because it is actually become a very competitive market, hasn't it, that you operate it? Absolutely. And I think we probably touched on it in the course of the conversation so, so far, but that differentiation that you have, is it simply that you're property people? I think it's a big factor. I think we understand property and we can understand how to get a hedge around things. I think, you know, most of the entrants in the market are have never been through a, a property cycle. You know, we've been there and we've done it. So we, we think we set things up in a way that our eyes are wide open and we can try and not only mitigate our risk, but also pass on that knowledge to our borrowers. I think that's really important. And I think the other thing is we've, we've built a big balance sheet over many, many years, mm. you know, with, without money coming out of the business. And therefore, when we make a decision to lend, it is our money we're lending. We then will choose how we structure that and, and, and get funding against yeah. it. But every decision we make, we lend our money. And what we're finding in the market at the moment where people are, are um, still in the market trying to lend, but actually they're reliant on another funder putting 95% of the money in, you, you end up with this double underwrite process mm. and you know the client can think it's going well and they're signed off, but when it goes to their funder, it stops. So, you know, it, it's property, it's, it, it's process and access to the money for our borrowers that is yeah. super important. And also, you know, we, because it's our money, we can just make the, the call. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you know, you, 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 you can empower your borrowers and you can empower your, empower your team to just make those calls and, and get the money out the door. And ultimately, you know, that's the one half of the business that I sort of take responsibility for is getting the money out. And then the property team led by Paul is all about asset management and making sure the money comes back in. Yeah. And because yeah, you are joint managing directors, aren't you, if I got that Yes, right. yes, yeah. And that's how does a, that work? Because that's usually an interesting dynamic, isn't it? It, it was an interesting one. When we did um, the sort of sit down with Cabot and talked about the next few years and where, where the journey's going to take us, it, it sort of just presented itself really clearly. You know, Paul had ex-property developer, really understands bricks and mortar, um, was building a property team within the business who who sort of just looked at all of our properties all the time. And, and it just seemed to come into effect that I dealt with everything towards getting money out the door. And he had the difficult job of making sure it came back in. And, right. and so, you know, our roles within the business were different. They were different enough that we could run a joint role yeah. knowing where we were. He's a great people person. Um, so he likes to look after the people side of the business okay. um, probably more than I do. Um, and, and it just transitioned really well. And when you've got somebody that you've worked with for 10 years who you implicitly trust, yeah. it, it just felt so natural that we would split the role and go the direction we're in. Brilliant. Trust is a big thing, isn't it? And it's, But it's not easy easy sometimes to gain that, particularly in the way in which perhaps David and Paul came into business. So any hints and tips for people thinking about bringing that level of seniority into their business and sharing some of the responsibility and ownership? I think it's, it's, it's really just, just be open. Just tell, tell, you, t tell them everything that's going on. Um, have an open book from day one. 
Um, you know, if you've got concerns on certain areas of the business, talk to them, share it with them. If and and it just worked. We all came from completely different paths to where yeah. we are today. Um, probably none of us ever thought we'd be lending money. No. But the combination of the three of us is, you know, I, the phrase I often use is, you know, one plus one equals three. Yeah. And and that really, I believe, with David, Paul and I, that that one plus one plus one equals four. Yeah. And I think that's been a, a huge factor of looking at the skills that we each bring, respecting them and bringing it together for the, for the benefit of the company. Definitely. And... I'm also intrigued because, you know, in, in what I've done over the years, you've seen some of the people that I've known, perhaps exited businesses, have a pot of cash. I suppose in a similar way, that the way you, your dad started the business. And they kind of dabble in property lending, particularly more perhaps the mezzanine than mm-hmm. mezzanine end. And, and there's so many horror stories out there. So the key bit that you obviously have clearly got right over the years consistently is that risk management approach. So how do you manage risk in a business that is notoriously risky to lend money into? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the things that you see a lot of people look at what we do and think it's easy. And, <laughs> and you know, I'm pleased we try and make it look easy, but, it, you know, it isn't. Any businesses that's successful out there, everybody's got to work really hard. Everybody's got to get it right. Um, you know, as I've said and we touched on earlier, you know, when you, you've got property people around you that really get property, the, the mitigation of the risk in property is is relatively you know easy to assess you know look we all have our challenges um, when you've got a loan book of our size and I think probably my my bigger challenge now is is not necessarily the individual lending within the business and the individual loans it's more the bigger picture cash flow management and capital structure because actually managing that right keeping all of your investors all of your lenders into the business comfortable and and the tick box and that they need as banks it's that that really is probably where most of my time is now spent okay. in in looking after that cash management and you know in our industry i you know i, I always but the one th- question that cabot square capital always asks me is why are we sitting on so much cash but it it's to me, it's the greatest risk mitigant. If you've got enough cash in the bank, you can trade through any down cycle. Yeah. You can support any borrowers. You can, you know, do what you want to do. And so, you know, we've always carried high levels of liquidity. Um, possibly Cabot would think like, we could put it to better use. But, yeah, you could leverage but it harder and faster. Could, absolutely. And then I suppose that's what some competitors over the years probably have done and come a cropper as a result. Absolutely, Warren. Yeah, I think it's... Um, you know, be cautious. We do take risk. We're in the risk business. That's what we do. And we, we get rewarded for, for the risks we take. But just remember, you know, the lessons of 2007-8, because mm. the thing that dried up at that stage was liquidity. Yeah. And therefore, if you can always keep liquidity in in any cycle, you know, we're, are we now in a potential downside in the property market? You read the papers. Mm. Yeah, we probably are. Um, there's talk of interest rates coming down next year and therefore people start to get a little bit more confident and you know yet again it, it just proven to me that having the cash in the bank is is an investment and not a cost to the business um, yeah and how have you seen demand I mean you've continued to grow so I'm assuming the demand's been there but you know with the higher rates of interest you know de- property developers have struggled to make sites new sites viable haven't they so what, how have you seen that higher interest rates impact on the market I think the the higher interest rates have been really interesting because you know as I said our, our our stock is money so when when base rate goes up you know our costs are significantly rising and we've seen a, a considerable rise in the cost of what we borrow we've been able to pass it through to our clients and you know still and very importantly it's got to be sustainable to them you've got to make sure that it works for everybody otherwise you know they've got no incentive to do what they're doing so I, I think that's a really important part of keeping keeping the clients sustainable. And I think, you know, it's it's a really interesting point of time at the moment because what we've got is a situation where the banks are starting to wobble a little bit on their decision making. We're in the past where we were, you know, base rate plus seven percent and the banks were base plus two, mm. you know, we were a long way from bank pricing, so it was it was hard trying to move your your bigger clients mm. to come back on board to MSP. What what's happened now is the banks have gone base plus five, we're base plus seven, 
And actually what we're finding is some of the regional developers now with the bigger balance sheets, you know, marketing departments, um, their own contractors, are actually happy to pay a little bit more for that for that, that service and service, flexibility yeah. and, and, and also the speed and operation in which we do things. So, you know, you, you've always got to look at the silver lining that comes out of things. And I think the silver lining from MSP is a transition from a loan book heavily based on small SMEs mm-hmm. to a loan book where we still, you know, really value those small SMEs and what they do, but, but actually bringing on bigger regional developers regional house builders who we can then lend to and that gives us you know i, I think a greater spread that's of risk across the market balance, balance portfolio of risk that's, you definitely? That, that's what you like to think <laughs> time will tell time will tell and you know we talked earlier about that employee engagement piece but i think that must come from a really positive corporate business culture so how did you go? I'm intrigued to know how you went about through all of those stages from family to entrepreneurial to PE, if that's kind of the stages that we've described that you've gone through. How did you ensure that there was this core kind of mission, vision, mission, values piece and that there was alignment throughout? I think every, every time we've brought somebody in um, to the business, right from the very early days, I'm, I'm bringing somebody in to do a job that I've done. Yeah. Um, so I like to think that you know if you're going to bring somebody into the team and get them to do a job, you should do it yourself to understand what you're asking them to do. That's become a little bit more challenging as the business has got bigger because uh, you know I have no marketing skills, I have no software development skills, and we've got a fantastic marketing department. We've got a great software engineers that are full time in the business developing our systems. But I think it's just always understanding what it is you're trying to resolve. If you can and have done it yourself, it makes it easier. Mm. And I think the the environment in which we all work is is a wonderful place to work in. We're, we're very open. We're very um, collaborative and sharing in everything we do. Um, we, we've recently moved and bought the offices that we're in, and we you know we've taken a whole suite and filled it with a gym and a staff room, and just watching the team grow and and using the facilities that we're able to provide them is is fantastic. And I think we're you know we yeah there's an element of luck involved. You've got to be lucky, but I always think you know luck is where skill and opportunity come together. Yeah, skill, and opportunity, and hard work. Yeah, and the, the the people that we employ are super skillful. We give them the opportunity, and then we hope that the luck falls on our side on the journey. Brilliant. And one of the other things that I admire about the business, particularly perhaps in recent years, is your very active as a business in commu- contributing to the local communities in which you operate. I mean, why is that personally important to you, Martin? And you know, what role does corporate social responsibility play in your business philosophy? I, I, it's become more and more important to me as sort of the business has grown and, and you know, we've, we've become a, a bigger employer in the area. Um, and I think just giving back to the community, we're all... We all work hard. We all take and, and, and take our rewards for what we do. But just giving back to the community and supporting those around you, I think, is is really important. We've had some phenomenal initiatives um, from from the social committee and the the marketing side that sort of then pull it all together. And 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 you know, it's it's just been incredible to watch. And it's something that I probably have little input in and just sit back and let everybody else who's much better at it pull it together but to be able to do what we do with with the various charities that we support um and and also just you know a fantastic event that we've had every year and the last two or three years now has been a volleyball tournament and we're now getting 31 teams from across the country coming down from bankers to you know, charities to all solicitors turning up and, and, you know, having a day on the beach and enjoying themselves and, yeah. and you know, with an with a underlying theme to sort of raise money for charity in the local community. Brilliant, definitely. But there, there's a strength there, isn't it, that it must be a really, something that's really passionate to Paul and you to actually go to the business, have the freedom Absolutely. to go do it. Go Absolutely. Raise money, be part of your community. And it, it comes back to that word of trust, doesn't it? We, we, we trust our team. We trust the judgments they're making. Um, you know, they, they know what we're trying to achieve, but we don't get involved in, in the detail of it. We let them 
take the, the, the message that MSP is trying to give and, and take it to the wider community. And, and yeah, and they, they, you know, to date, touch wood, they've been super successful and Brilliant. we benefit from that in so many different ways. So what's next for MSP Capital then? Well, what's next? It's, it's really just more of the same. Um, I believe the opportunity is probably bigger today than it's ever been. Um, it's, it's a balance of raising more funding in the city um, and, and getting our capital structure right yeah. to really be able to put the money out and support. I'm always going to be south focused. You know, I, I, the, the value of being able to drive to a site and put your hand on the wall is, you yeah. know, to me is the ultimate. Because it is bricks and mortar. Yeah, and a lot, you know, a lot of people talk to us all. Oh, you know, why don't you do what you do in Manchester? But look, there are different businesses doing what we do in those areas. So, you know, let it happen. Let it organically grow from where we are. And you know, I'd like to think we can get the book relatively quickly up to half a billion, um, and then you know, see what happens from there and keep pushing on by, beyond. And do you ever think you'd diversify? You know, another route to growth is diversifying into other sort of financial products, lending. Do you, could you see that happening, or are you very focused on your niche? I think I'm very focused on what we do and our niche. I think we're very good at what we do, um, and and probably a lesson I've learned on a personal business and, and corporate business side over the last 20 years is, is every single time I deviate off that mean, I get, I get it wrong. Yeah. And, and therefore, <laughs> just stick to the knitting. You know, why, why try and reinvent the wheel on something when we've got a business, we've got a business model that works. You know, try and stay um, on top of it from a software and development side of it. Try and sort of look at how we can operate better and faster. But at the end of the day, just do what we know we're good at and try, don't try and replicate what others do yeah. different. But it's hard, isn't it, with, you know, with your mind, your, your spirit, that entrepreneurial nature. We all can succumb to that shiny new thing over there or that opportunity over there. You know, how have you kept so focused for 23 years? It's, um, it, it, it's difficult. Probably one of the biggest pulls to me is catering. I, okay. I absolutely loved my time in catering. Um, you know, I was always front of house. I had an incredible kitchen, an engine. Yeah. And, and because of that, you end up, when you're front of house, finding it really, really easy because you know what's coming out is good. And actually, that, that's no different to now. I know that the engine of MSP yeah. is in great hands. And therefore, my job sort of guiding MSP and, and doing what I do is so much easier because I know it's all going well. So probably my biggest my biggest pull is, is catering. Okay. Um, I, I own a share in a restaurant in Penn Hill, um, which was again just a emotive heart decision I yeah. wanted to get back involved with. I don't I don't go but I don't go there apart from to eat, but I just love the story and the growth journey that they're on, and just try and help in the background and sort of just share my experiences in catering, but it, also just okay. in business and what are the important so things that to just look keeps at. Keeps that little keeps that little itch. That little itch. Yeah. Satisfied. Yeah. Enable you to yeah, and I have, prom I have promised Sarah that I I won't go back to working evenings and weekends. And <laughs> so you know I've got to keep that Hospitality promise. Hospitality is out. Yeah, for yeah, you. it's out for me. Yeah, and you know, interestingly, because you know, you don't do what you as a team have done and what you've done as an individual, Martin, without some form of personal sacrifice. So how has running MSP and doing what you've done affected you as an individual from a personal perspective? It's a really good question. Um, it's, it's something I do reflect on. I think when you sort of get to my age, you start looking back and thinking, what would you have done differently? I probably, I wouldn't say the business itself um, and what we do has created the challenge. I was probably it's more my focus and my inability to stop um, has caused me challenges. Um, you know, I, I, I split up with Helen 15, 16 years ago. Um, that caused me some challenges seeing my daughter and, you know, that type of thing. Really, why was that? It was because I was just so 100% motivated into yeah. the business. I wasn't seeing what was going the on outside. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm delighted to say Helen and I have a fantastic relationship now, get on really well. She lives around the corner. Harriet's, you know, a, a wonderful girl. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, you try and cover over those things that went in the past. But I think it's... One day, I think I would like to not be the first in and the last out. Yeah. 
and and I don't know how I get there <laughs> because because I love what I do and it's it sort of feels like the family baby yeah and and therefore you just always want to be there and I can't imagine a day without it yeah wow thank you for your honesty Martin and I suppose that probably leads on to one of the final questions around you you know what does motivate you to get up and be the first in and the last out what where does that drive and hunger still come from despite the success I think it's it, it's watching the team and watching the development within the business. We've got some incredible talent in the business. They don't realise how good they are, and probably we don't, but there is some amazing talent within the business. And I think that the legacy that I would like to give, you know, eventually is when I'm not there or not capable of doing what I do, is I know that they will take that business to the next level. Brilliant. And And to just watch that development is... I, I just find it hugely inspiring and, yeah. and it's what drives me because t- to think that they can forge a career from a, an initial phone call to MSP to taking over a finance department to running a capital structure and of having seen that of some of the individuals and, and then the software guy, you know, how, did I ever think we'd have software engineers in our business? Never. You know, we've now got four full time developing loan management systems and and it's I I just find the whole thing inspiring and that's why you know I just find it addictive to just continue wanting to just grow the business and and the team within it brilliant I've got to talk to you about Wimbledon Town Football Club Martin we recently had Jimmy the general new general manager on the podcast so um you know it is a passion of yours. Recently, I suppose, the last couple of years, as I understand it, acquired the ownership of the club. Um, how did that come about? What excites you? What, where's the interest in football? You know, what's, it, what, what's motivated you to get involved? I've, I've always loved football. Um, I was always terrible at it when I was young, but I loved the competitive side of it and, and the watching it. So being a big Bournemouth supporter for a long time, we've had a box at Bournemouth for nine seasons now. Um, and, and have still got the box at Bournemouth. Lee, um, who runs our development side of the business and the, the development funding side, is has been involved with Wimborne for 25 years. Okay. Approached me one day, day and said, look, we've got a fantastic new stadium. It was part of a Section 106 agreement that had to be built to give planning on the old site. So we've got this incredible facility, you know, will you come and have a look at it and, and see what you think? So, you know, jumped in the car, went and had a look. And I think within, I don't know, three or four weeks, the deal was done. And yeah. it was, I, I was just sold on it. And I've, I hardly ever go to the Bournemouth box anymore. The team go and have a great time. But I seem to find myself traveling to Biddeford or Melksham <laughs> or Cribs. The or less glamorous end of football. Uh, definitely. We, we, we've got a trip to Mousel coming up, which is a... A good five-hour drive, but I don't like to miss a game. Um, it, it's a phenomenal facility. There's some fantastic people there, and you know. And again, I, I just see an opportunity. I, you know, we've got such a great stadium, such a great 3G pitch, which is, you know, generates a lot of income, mm. um, and and probably slightly different to my philosophy with MSP. My my drive and determination with Wimborne is to make it self-sufficient because it certainly isn't at the moment yeah. and it takes you know uh, it takes a lot to realize how much money has to be put into non-league football yeah. um, and I've got total respect for all of those non-league teams out there because the journey to get funding is is always difficult mm. um, bringing Jimmy in was you know a by chance he came to see me about something else was a little bit unsure what he was going to do and I just thought wow you know what what a great guy I've known Jimmy a long time Mm -hmm. to be able to bring him in and and be sort of there all the time which I was unable to do um and touch wood it's gone fantastically well since um I must mention we're top of the table so it might change on Friday or Saturday as it does every week (laughs) but but I I can sit here now and tell you we're top of the table and are trying very hard to get promoted this year so watch this space absolutely so my final question on every podcast is is more of a personal question for you Martin is we've talked about business success but what's your definition of personal success I I think it comes back to what we've just touched on you know my my personal feeling of success will be watching that business move forward when I'm not around Mm. to you know put the hours in that I do um 
that ultimately will give me more satisfaction than than anything else. Um, and and it's something that you know is what, as I've said, it drives me to do what I do today. And and I know that the talent in that business is so much more talented than I am, and therefore the the journey and the future of MSP is super exciting. Brilliant, fantastic. And if people want to learn more about MSP Capital, where can they go? Well, always can come and see us. Come and have a coffee. Um, we're in Paul. Um, our website, mspcapital.co.uk, um, is is a great website superbly developed by the team um and yeah you know the door's always open and and the coffee machine's always on and if you've got any any aspirations in property or property challenges we'd we'd love to chat and see see if we can share some of our knowledge and find something we can do together brilliant martin i've loved having you on you on as a guest i think you've been open you've been honest it's been great to find out more about you, the story, more about MSP Capital and your industry. So thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Warren. Thank you for listening to the Evolve to Succeed podcast. My hope with every episode is that you've learned something new or heard something that challenged your way of thinking and further motivated you on your path towards becoming a more knowledgeable, informed and inspired individual and business leader. And don't forget, if you'd like to learn more about Evolve and the services we offer and how we can help you and your business confidently start, grow and exit, then please go to evolveadvisory.co.uk. Please also help and support this podcast by subscribing, liking and giving us a positive review on your favourite listening platform. Thanks for listening and see you next week.